Patel in connection with this civil rights discussion has been this question of a jury trial in contempt cases. That is to say that if a judge issues an order in a federal court and uh, for one reason or another there is no compliance with the order and uh, he holds a person in criminal contempt, does that person under the Constitution have a right to a trial by jury? Well, I think the answer is no, because in the most recent case decided by the Supreme Court of the United States about three weeks ago, involving the governor of Mississippi, the court, by a five to four decision, said very explicitly that in these contempt cases, there is no constitutional right of trial by jury. So from the standpoint of the highest court in the land, that settles the question for the moment. It should be pointed out, of course, that it was a split decision, namely by a vote of five to four. But that doesn't settle it, of course, so far as the Congress is concerned. And I thought maybe it might be well to visit with you a little on this general subject. Let me approach it in this fashion. And I go back to 1900, 33, during my first term in the Congress. We had a member from Pennsylvania by the names of, name of James M. Beck. He was a rather short-statured person, impeccably dressed, and was by all odds one of the most brilliant lawyers that I ever knew. In fact, he was a brilliant constitutional lawyer and had often appeared in the Supreme Court of the United States. I made it my business as something of a youngster to cultivate the acquaintanceship and the friendship of Congressman Beck. And I recall so very well, one day he said to me, Dirksen, I've just finished a book. It's off the press, and I'm going to send you an autographed copy. Now, the title of this book was Neither Purse Nor Sword. Let me uh, repeat it. The title was Neither Purse Nor Sword. Now, what Congressman Beck really meant was that the presidency or the executive branch under the Constitution is entrusted with the sword because the Constitution makes the president the commander-in-chief of the armies and navies. What he meant by the purse was that under the Constitution, the Congress has exclusive power over the uh, national purse because not a dollar can be taken out of the federal treasury except in pursuance of an appropriation made by law. Now that leaves the judicial branch of the government. It got neither purse nor sword. And the question was, how then uh, does it function and function effectively? The historian Fisk who has written a good many treatises on that critical period in American history, has stated that were it not for the federal court system of the country, the Constitution could never have been put into practical working effect. And I rather believe that that is a correct and accurate statement. And yet it has neither purse nor sword. Now, that gets us around uh, to this jury issue. Because when, for instance, a federal court issues an order, let's assume that the order is not obeyed. It could be uh, a criminal case, or in the nature of a crime, or it could be strictly a civil case. How then does a federal judge go about the business of securing compliance? Well, in civil cases, uh, it offers no difficulty, because there I think it is clear uh, 
and clear from the Constitution itself that uh, the uh, power of the judge to hold a person in contempt was uh, certainly not beset with a jury trial. That could involve an antitrust case. It could involve uh, an enforcement of, let us say, a trust. You find it in divorce cases in state courts. You might find it in the cancellation of naturalization papers. In all those cases which are civil in nature, there the court does the determination and there is no jury involved at any time. But let us suppose that the contempt of the court through noncompliance is rather criminal in nature and punitive so that it does become criminal then what does the court do? Well, that's the very issue with which we're dealing at the present time. Because there again, a federal court must have a weapon in order to enforce its orders. Now, it's been rather common, I think in uh, 30 or more different statutes, that the court can impose a fine and the court can impose a jail sentence where there is contempt of court. And in those cases, there is no provision under the statute, and certainly none in the Constitution, for a trial by jury. Actually, insofar as I know, the only places in the Constitution where you get a constitutional jury trial would be in common law cases where more than $20 is involved or in the case of crimes, because there it's mandatory to have a jury trial, or it might be said in the case of eminent domain, where property is seized for a public use, you would anticipate that the value and the damage to the owner would be determined by a jury. But other than that, there is no other provision for a jury trial in the case of criminal contempt. But as I indicated, the court finally needs a weapon. The president has a weapon, and the Congress has a weapon. You see, the Congress could abolish many of these courts if it so desired. It can refuse to appropriate money for a government department and virtually put them out of business. So many things that lie within this power. But when it comes to the course, virtually their only weapon then is this weapon of contempt or holding in contempt if a respondent or a defendant refuses to abide by the order of the court. Now, how are rights affected here? And why does this come into play? Well, let's take a, a case. Let us take any state where an election official uh, is accosted by a person who wants to register to vote. It could be a Negro, it could be a white person, it could be anybody. So this official says now you have to qualify to vote. And in order to qualify, I'm going to ask you to read a page of the United States Constitution, and then you're going to have to interpret it for me. Well, he may use that as a pretext for simply disqualifying a person and refusing to register him. Suppose then that this same person finally goes before some registrars appointed by a federal judge and says that man who's in charge of the election machinery will not register me. So the registrars undertake to examine into his qualifications under state law and see whether or not he's qualified to vote. They say he's qualified to vote, but how do you actually get him registered by a state official? Well, the court issues an order and says, now here's John Brown. He does qualify. Now you put him on the poll books and register him so he can vote in the next election. Well, suppose the election official says, I'll not do anything of the kind. So back to the court you go. The court has to issue an order and bring him in.
and say, now you either register John Brown or I'm going to have to hold you in contempt of court. If he still refuses, under the 57 Act, as we passed it seven years ago, the court can say, all right, I'll fine you $300 and uh, I'll send you to jail for 45 days. That was the limit of the punishment under that act. Now it was undertaken to write the same kind of a provision into the bill that is presently pending before the Congress. There were some, however, who disagreed with the idea. And as a result, an amendment was submitted whereby there had to be a jury trial in every case, in every case, where a criminal contempt of court was involved. The majority leader and myself thereupon offered a substitute, which provided, in effect, that so long as the aggregate fine was not over $300, and so long as the cumulative jail sentence was not over 30 days, there would be no right, no right that could be enforced of a trial by jury. If, however, the court went beyond those limits in the nature of a fine or in the nature of a jail sentence, then it became mandatory for the judge to give the defendant a jury trial. Now, that's the whole thing that is involved here, and it appertains mainly to the business of enforcing the voting rights in some of the states where those rights have been denied, either through the arbitrary application of registration requirements or otherwise. Now, you see, the whole situation is clear in this respect. A state within reason can do anything it wants about registration. It must, however, apply it uniformly to all people, whether black or white. It can have one liberal standard for white people and a different standard of qualification for black people, so that when that develops and the election officials are obdurate about it, then the court must have some kind of a weapon with which to enforce its order. And that's the whole situation involved in the jury trial issue. It's rather interesting that when we wrote that into the first Civil Rights Act in 1957, one might have thought there would be a good many cases under that provision. The fact of the matter is that in a period of seven years, there has not been a single case that was brought under the provisions of the 57A. So I wonder whether we weren't making a mountain out of a molehill with all the discussion that this particular proposal has received seven years later in 1964. It's good to visit with you.